This edition of On the Bookshelf, featuring musician, playwright Ralph Tufo, is sponsored by the Winthrop Book Depot and Cafe, located at 11 Somerset Avenue. I'd rather be lucky than good. Sink a hole in Welcome to another edition of On the Bookshelf. I'm Pete Solomon. In a moment, we're going to visit the Hackers Haven Golf Course near Boston. That's the scene of I'd Rather Be Lucky Than Good, a play authored by Ralph Tufo. And Ralph is our guest. Ralph, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Pete. Thanks for having me come in. It's always a pleasure to well, talk to you. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Now, this is a musical comedy featuring 10 original songs. Mm -hmm. So give us a little insight in the, in the process. It's not the first play you've written. Uh, Ralph's Rock and Ralph's Roadhouse was very successful. We'll talk about that in a minute. But... Did you write the songs first or did you write the book first? That's a good question. It's sort of, I wrote one song and part of the, part of the uh, play. Well, what I did is I used uh, material from golfing with my friends. They inspired me. The idiosyncratic behaviors of my friends, things I have seen on the golf course, uh, stories that I've heard. And so I started taking notes, just, just little quotes that one of the characters might say, another character might say. And then I came up with a, you know, a song, which is the title, I'd Rather Be Lucky Than Good. And then so uh, as, as time developed, I'd write a song, I'd have more notes, uh, so forth. And then eventually I saw, you know, about, let's say about a year and a half ago, I started working on a script. And then I saw what songs I had the beginnings of, and then I worked more on the songs, and then what song might be missing, so I wrote a song. So it's kind of hand in hand, uh, and, and, and then eventually put it all together. Um, I worked with members of my band to do the recording of the song, so we'll have a studio version of the song uh, when the performances are. So. Uh, it's been a fun experience. I've learned a lot, taken, you know, done some research as well. And but the basis of the play is based on my experiences with my friends, the joy and the pain of golf. Now, allow me a brief digression. Mm -hmm. I understand that when you were growing up, there was a cor an accordion in your home. <laughs> you learned to play it, and right. this obviously began your lifelong passion to make music. How old were you? I was five. Right. My grandfather, who came from Italy, he played the accordion. Uh, my, my brother had taken lessons but stopped. My cousin was quite a good accordion player. So it was in the family, mm -hmm. so I started taking lessons. And I took lessons oh, probably up until I was about 12. And then it no longer became cool. And then I kept it a secret while I was in high school. And didn't start playing again until like, after I was in, graduated from college. So you were in high school at Lynn English. Right. You were not involved in the music scene at that time? Not really, no. It was after, um, after uh, I would say, college. And I, I also taught myself piano. I took voice lessons here in Winthrop and piano lessons. And then, um, oh, I'd say when I was in my uh, mid-20s, I, I, I joined a band, played Irish music, then played with that band for 12 years, and then eventually went into Cajun and Zydeco music. I've been playing with the Squeezebox Stompers now for quite a while. And uh, it all, it, I, there was no grandiose plan. I just kind of, things sort of happened. Now, Ralph, Boston is a great music town. We have the symphony, we have the Boston Pops. In mm. the disco era, Donna Summer, a Boston native, mm. was at the Vanguard. Uh, NSYNC was uh, a very popular pop music band. Mm -hmm. But Zydeco and Cajun music, how did you wind up doing that? Well, um, the story is that I was playing in the, uh, this Irish group called the Gloucester Horn, Pipe and Clock Society, and one member of the band was from England, and he had heard Clifton Chenier play in London. So he said, you know, you've got to listen to this guy. He played the accordion. You listen to this guy. I think you really like it. So I went out and bought some albums, and I fell in love with it because it really opened up a whole new dimension of style of playing because uh, Cajun Zydeco music has you know um, syncopated rhythms you improvise it's all dance music um, 
And then um, I ran into this other person who wanted to start a band together. We started the Boogaloo Swamis, uh, started playing out on the street in Cambridge. We ended up winning four Boston Music Awards, playing throughout New England. And then later on, um, that band broke up, and then I formed the Squeezebox Stompers. So but Let's back up a step, yeah. if we may. So you finish high school. There's a legion of great teachers who are graduates of Salem State, uh -huh. including the one I'm sitting next to. You went to Salem State. Yeah. Did you know you were going to get into education at that time? Oh, yeah, I was an education major. That was my goal, always to teach. Um, I mean, I played music all my life, but um, I never thought about actually um, you know, being, uh, you know, going on the road, you know, throughout the country of the United States or being a rock star or anything like that. That was, you know, I just wanted to play music with my friends, basically, and I love music. So, um, it, you know, it was, there was no plan of being a, mu a full-time musician. Um, Instead, you went to, went through middle school and you taught reading and English and social studies. Is that a positive experience? Oh, yeah. Uh, I taught here uh, for about 12 years, um, and it was very, I mean, I really enjoyed it, but it was also very convenient for my children because, you know, when they were in school, I was in school. When mm -hmm. they were out of school, I was out of school. So um, then um, eventually I moved on to North Shore Community College. Uh, I taught reading and English and a whole bunch of different subjects, and we, we went we went on, um, uh, we went down to New Orleans after Katrina as a group to do, um, you know, rebuilding of, uh, of housing and so forth. We went down three times, and that's where I got the idea to write the play, uh, which was originally called the Rock and Ralph's Roadhouse, which I switched to the Katrina Roadhouse from talking to people that were survivors of the hurricane. And so I wrote, wrote that play. It took me a long time. And then, like I said, on the 10th anniversary of Katrina, we put the play on at the Winthrop School of Performing Arts. Mm -hmm. And it was very successful. It was a fundraiser. Now, I, I don't want to gloss over the fact that you mentioned that you played for the Boogaloo, Swa uh, Boogaloo Swamis for right. a, a number of years. And, right. and you uh, pointed out correctly that you won four Boston Music Awards. Right. Then you started the Squeezebox Stompers, didn't right. you? Right. Right. Um, actually, um, with, well, I'd say, uh, three former members of the Boogaloo Swamis. Mm -hmm. So we kind of already knew a lot of the material. And then I was playing uh, with another friend of mine, Larry Pitt. Plitt. And um, so we kind of merged. And we were, you know, we hit the floor running because we knew the material. And so um, we had everything else from the past. So it was like an easy transition. Then you recorded Stompin' in the Crossroads. Right. Proud of that one, aren't you? Yes, that was another one of those uh, serendipitous occasions. We played at a coffee house in Andover, and I didn't really know that they were recording us. They said, do you mind if we're recording? I thought they were doing a video recording. Mm -hmm. So I said, sure, go ahead. And then they did an audio recording from the board. Then they sent us the, the files. I listened to the files. I said, that's great. That sounds great. So we took... Uh, the best 13 songs, as is, and we made this, which is our last, it's the most recent CD, um, and we made a, a live CD from that. So you've done that, mm. you talked about writing uh, uh, the Katrina Roadhouse. Right. Uh, what was more difficult, writing that one or the new one? I would say the Katrina Roadhouse was more difficult because it was my first. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's a, a little bit longer. It had 12 actors. Um, it, it was, a, I had to do a lot more um, academic research. Even though I went down in New Orleans three times and so forth, there was a lot of research I had to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and it took me longer to put it together. So I would say that was more difficult. So the new play is, as we said, mm -hmm. I'd rather be lucky than good. Right. And your words now, it, it centers on golf, luck, friendship. Right. Um, the, uh, the play has two main characters, Lou, a 63-year-old white male who is right. a teacher. 
Right. You were a teacher. Is right. Some, a little uh, bit. Some of you and Lou? Yeah, there's definitely, especially his golf game. Uh, <laughs> and Max, a 63-year-old black male, he's an accountant. Right. So they've been friends for 45 years. Right. And uh, they were teammates on the BU track team. And right. uh, they've followed each other's lives so closely. And yeah. they've dealt with ups and downs. Right. And, and Lou, at this point in his life, uh, is trying to deal with the fact that he's now a widower. Right. And Max is probably at the end of a 37-year marriage. Right. But they're there for each other. And right. Isn't that the key to friendship? Right. Being there and being there not uh, like one of the songs in the play. You are a friend indeed. Your actions show that you're, you're a friend. You know, they've each helped each other out. You know, when Lou's um, wife passed away suddenly, Max was there, he was like shadowing him all the time. And then Max has had some difficulty his, um, going through a, a divorce and previously had gone through cancer treatments. Lou was taking him there. So they're, they're always, quote unquote, there for each other. But the funny part about it is they are distinct different personalities and they annoy each other. That's what <laughs> to, friends do. <laughs> to a great deal. And they play pranks on each other, uh, which happens you know, on their journey through the, the golf course. The golf course is an important component to this. Yes. Now, you could have put this in an office, or you could have put it in a dormitory, right. or, but, but it's the golf course, and, and that's a, a world unto itself. And, and it really opens up a lot of opportunities for you. Everybody who's ever swung a golf club has had to deal with the golf gods. <laughs> you, you feel like you've hit a drive right on the screws and all of a sudden a gust right. of wind takes it into the rough. You, exactly. You, you, you get a bad bounce. Uh, you, your ball is hit perfectly and rolls and rolls and rolls right into a water hazard. Mm -hmm. But the golf gods are, gods are part of your play. Yes, they are. And they also are in favor of you for a certain amount of time and then they can switch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are four golf gods and they're dressed in you know, the Greek tunics, mm -hmm. and one of them controls the air. That would be Aeolina. Right. Another one con controls the trees. Of course, that's Sequoia. Right. Another one con controls the water. Aquatina. And the other one controls the land. Terra firma. So, they also serve in, in the play, the role, like in traditional uh, Greek play, they are the chorus. No one, no, the, the, the actors in the play don't know they're there, but the Greek gods are singing backup chorus and they're doing dance routines mm -hmm. to the songs. And they, um, they come out again in the beginning of the second half and talk about, you know, their control and the prediction, and the die is cast, what will happen? Um, so they, they're, they're, um, they play a significant role in the play just as some people believe they play a significant role when you play golf. Did for me. Rather be lucky than good. That's great. <laughs> it's a wonderful title. Where does it come from? That's, um, it's a common sports expression. Mm -hmm. I think um, a lot of the time it's, it's, it's set in golf, but I think um, in other sporting events people have used it. I'm not exactly sure where it came from. I'm not either, but the first yeah. time I ever heard it, a legendary New York Yankees pitcher from the 30s and 40s, Lefty Gomez, uh -huh. uh, had a game saved because Joe DiMaggio went back deep into center field and caught a, a long fly ball that would have turned the game around. Yeah. And, uh, and Lefty Gomez, after the game, had the reputation of being a real wit, said, well, I'd rather be lucky than good. Right. Yeah. So I, I think, yeah, somewhere along the lines, it, it's, it's from sports. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, the dynamic between these, these two guys is great, but yeah. there are other peripheral people, uh, the Red Hat ladies. Right. This is sort of a, the metaphor of golf is like life, okay, where you come across certain obstacles you have to overcome. Mm -hmm. you, tr you strive to do your best, but most of the time you're only average, you know. So golf is a journey of 18 holes, and life is a journey. And along the journey, you run into obstacles, and you're, or people could be obstacles. And so one of the, one of the obstacles that Lou runs into uh, is Isabel, the lady from the Red Hat League, um, who 
um, is a bit of a prude, snob, etc. She runs into Lou, and I don't know, I, I guess I can say this. You know, Lou is taking diuretics for his blood pressure and so forth and large prostate. So he's in the middle of the fifth fairway, and he has to, he has to urinate, okay? And there's no men's room or bathroom until you get to the, the, the clubhouse at the ninth hole. So mm -hmm. he's in the woods. Like other people who play golf do, men, you know, our age, whatever, I admit it. So he's, he's in the woods, and she happens to come by and sets her off. Uh, she, you know, is called, you know, is this, acting like an animal, you're a pervert, you're a third level sex offender, blah, 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 so forth and so on, really goes, you know, gets into it. And um, she says, why can't we have the civility like we used to have in the, in, in, in the old days at, at country clubs? And then he begins to That's tell a great her. Great answer to that. You know, he's Jewish, mm -hmm. Max is black, and she's a woman. And he says, you wouldn't have been able to play in the country clubs back in those days. And so we, and then uh, she calls him a rebel rouser and so forth and so on. And, um, and then she walks away, picks up her ball, and he says, and don't forget, it's a one stroke penalty if you take your ball out of the woods, <laughs> yes. you know? So he runs into her and um, he, uh, Max runs, uh, has a, a, a collision with the groundskeeper on one of the holes, his ball, hits Jason, the groundskeeper, on the back. You couldn't see it because it was a big hill. And he gets into an argument with him, and they have a little tussle. And Max is just so fed up with everything. I don't want to give away too much of the play, but at the end of the first act, he takes his golf bag and just tosses it into the water. And before we get away from Lou, yeah. uh, we talk about this woman's frustration with him, mm -hmm. but what about his frustration with her. She and her red, sets, red hat society women play so slowly. Right, and, and, they're, and they're like constantly, uh, he refers to them as like a bowel obstruction, <laughs> backing the whole course up, yeah. you know. I <laughs> uh, hope I'm not offending anybody with all of this. So, but one of the things I put that in there, that they were holding them up, it gives them a chance to talk. Mm -hmm. Because this is what happens on the golf course. You, oh, it's not just about four guys or two guys going out to play golf. You're waiting around. Sure. And so you start talking about things. And people start talking about really serious stuff while they're waiting to tee off or get involved in philosophical things or political things, um, personal issues. And so all of this happens in the midst of a... Uh, round of golf and it's a social event mm -hmm. and, and uh, we talk a lot about the friendship involved and um, like uh, they support each other it, it, it's a uh, it's more than just golf it is but yeah we should mention that Hackers Haven is a public golf course right and so these people aren't out there just talking business like they might be at some posh country no. club no they're talking about everything right they're, they're friends, they're in leagues, they know each other from a long time. They're in the Liniment League, mm -hmm. or sometimes referred to the Ben Gay League, <laughs> right? You know, so they all have their aches and pains, but they're out there. None of them are good, you know. Some of them might be lucky, but they're not like really good golfers, you know. And so it's, it's but for some people, it's a big part of their life, um, you know, uh, especially people who are retired, some of people retire to the golf club, mm -hmm. of course. It's where athletes go to die, <laughs> you know? Sure. Yeah. Well, we're not going to give away the ending, but I no. think it's noteworthy that the whole golf match that particular day hinges yeah. on a wager. Can we talk about that? Right. There is uh, Max um, comes up with this concept of the blind bet, okay? And... He, Essentially, you have to agree to it before you before you it does what it is. You have to agree to do what your partner wants you to do if you lose, and you have to accept ahead of time that it's in your best interests, because this person is your friend. You've known him for forty-five years. Mm -hmm. 
So do you agree to do what I ask you to do if you lose? And so Lou at first says, no, what do you want me to walk through a cobra pit? He said, no, it's got to be your advantage. So what Max wants Lou to do is to go on a blind date. Because Max, who's now separated, met a woman at one of those speed dating, senior speed dating events. Mm -hmm. But she would only go out with him if it was a double date. So he had to arrange for a double date. And Max knows nothing about the other woman, the woman who would go no. out with Lou. And they joke about it. She could be the bearded lady from the circus. Mm -hmm. She could be out on a pre-release. She could be a violent offender. No idea who she is. So Lou had agreed to it. So he uh, then comes up from Max. Max has to call his son and his wife. His six weeks ago, he discovered that his wife was having an affair. They had a big blowout. She left. His son refuses to speak to him. His son blames him for being too controlling. Uh, and so Lou, realizing that he needs at some point, no matter what happens, he needs to talk to his son and his wife again. So he says, you have to call it Max. Max uh, says, no, no, no way. He said, well, you, a deal's a deal. So that's what they have to do. And then Lou says, well, since you came up with a blind bit date um, idea, I'd like to up the financial wager. So he ups it to 100 bucks. So that, that's, what's, that's what the, the play centers on. Hole by hole, you, if you win the hole, you get a point. If you end up tying nine and nine at the end, you flip a coin, see who wins. And that's the results. So this is what the whole play is uh, sort of based on, hole by hole, what happens. Now, there's 18 holes. I don't have the whole play go through 18 holes. I pick out, there's really like six holes. The, the tee box, you know, the, the fairway, and, and um, the green. So, it, it, so it, it play lasts about, I would say, about a total of about an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. What kind of challenge is it going to be to stage this? That's good. I, I'm not absolutely sure, but I know it's a challenge. <laughs> I've got to have the golf gods in the back, mm -hmm. right, with two microphones that are kind of hidden by scenery and bushes, making, you know, They'll have like those radio microphones, so they'll be singing like a chorus. The, the two guys, Lou and Max, will have wireless mics that will be attached to their golf bags so that they'll pull them out when they sing. So I've got to have a tee box, a fairway, and a green in the front, and a place for the golf gods in the back. So that just the set design will be a challenge. In terms of blocking, um, what are the golf gods doing while Lou and Max are in front and talking, and their choral parts and their dancing parts? Um, I'm going to get a lot of help from Trudy Macero, who mm -hmm. is the director of the Winthrop School of Performing Arts. Sure. She's going to be my go-to person. She's going to be like my consultant. She, she, she vowed to help me out with a lot of things. So I'm counting on her to help me, especially with the choreography and the blocking. And then uh, a former, um, I haven't asked him yet, but my former piano teacher and vocal coach helped with the singing, you know, the I harmonies. I think you just asked him. What's that? I think you just asked him. <laughs> <laughs> it's on TV before I asked him. <laughs> I won't mention his name. Okay. But, uh, so I'm going to be asking him. I'm sure he'll do that. So anything else, uh, you know, uh, production-wise, business, publicity, tickets. I have a, an intern, um, Donovan Skeppel. Uh, from Suffolk, he's going to be working with me on the production. Mm -hmm. He'll be my, <coughs> excuse me, production intern. And I'm going to be looking for a stage manager. You know, there's a lot of, you know, I'm just, it's six months away, but I'm really like in the throes of it right now. Well, we talked about what a challenge it will be to stage. It's right. also going to be a challenge to cast because the golf guards also play other roles during the course of the play. Right. I do have one of the golf guards cast already. Mm -hmm. She was a, a, a woman from the, the previous play that I put on in Katrina. Um, she's going to play the role of Aquatina and the golf widow 
who sings the golf widow blues. Yes, that's a wonderful song. <laughs> so she's all set. I have some people I'm going to be talking to, I uh, hope within the next couple of weeks. And then I'm also setting up, uh, going to different websites, uh, stage source and so forth, mm -hmm. putting out ads for casting. Actually, just found out today, we're, gonna, we're going to do the auditions here in the basement, a week of auditions here. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So. Now, uh, tell me about, uh, do you have a table reading first? Uh, when do you begin rehearsals? How, do, how does this all lay we, out? Um, we do the auditions. Uh, it'll be like uh, really like the first week of May, mm -hmm. callbacks the second week of May. We'll have a meeting of the, the final cast, like May or June, we'll take the summer off. We start rehearsals um, right after Labor Day. So it's like six weeks, three nights of rehearsals, plus the tech week. And then the, the performances are at the Winthrop School of Performing Arts starting October 12th. Two weekends, two um, weekends in a row with, with a Sunday matinee as the last performance. Mm -hmm. And as a project as a whole, mm -hmm. will this be easier or more difficult to, to mount than, uh, than Katrina's Roadhouse? Well, I am going to be the producer, director, music director, uh, musician playing my, my band. Uh, the three of us, the Squeeze Walk Stompers, are going to be playing the music live. Mm -hmm. Uh, I also plan to sweep the floor at the end of the night. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's a lot going on. I plan to get as much help as I can. Um, uh, I don't know whether it's going to be um, easier or difficult. It's going to be a lot of work. Sure. They both are a lot of work. Um, I'm going to give it my best. I can guarantee that it will be an, uh, a fun night out for people. That's great. There's some serious aspects to it. It's very poignant in places. Yeah, there, there are serious aspects about friendship and fate, um, and you know, there's a uh, a rap about this getting old is getting old, mm -hmm. sort of funny. But it also talks about getting old. These guys are 63. Sure. You know, the, what does the future hold? Uh, so some serious, but mostly comic, sort of a farce. The golf gods. I mean, really. <laughs> Finally, Ralph, now mm. you're busy with the squeeze box stoppers, right. very busy with this. You have mm. another play behind you. What's next? What's next is Thursday night, um, one of my plays, another play that I wrote, is a finalist for um, the Portsmouth uh, Prescott Park Arts Festival. Uh, I've been working uh, on this, it's been sort of started as a workshop, and then the people in the workshop wrote plays. So. Three plays were selected to be finalists, um, and Thursday, um, the 22nd, uh, there's a stage reading of my play, and uh, if, I, if I happen to be selected as a winner, my play will be put on live at the Prescott Parks uh, Arts Festival in the summer. Well, by the time this airs, you will have already accepted the trophy. and. <laughs> Excellent. Speaking of acceptance, we were so pleased that you accepted our invitation. Thank you very much, Ralph Tufo. Okay. Best of luck in all your endeavors, and particularly with I'd Rather Be Lucky Than Good. Thank you, Pete. It's always great talking thank to you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on On the Bookshelf. I'm Pete Solomon. I'd rather be lucky than good Sink a hole in one if I could Lead a life of charm and romance I'd get lucky Every chance I won't waste my time on the assembly line Slaving over every nickel and dime I ride for milk and honey I'll fall into money Be happy all the time I'd rather be lucky than good Yes, I would Be lucky than good I'd rather be lucky than good a life of leisure suits me good. Fame and fortune will come my way, but they'll arrive the easy way. I'll be in the right place at the right time. Get discovered on this bar stool of mine. My name up in lights, I miss the lucky tonight. Fan this edition of On the Bookshelf, featuring musician, playwright Ralph Tufo, is sponsored by 
the Winthrop Book Depot and Cafe located at 11 Somerset Avenue.